Good morning, Camelback Bible Church. Are you ready to begin? Or do you want to just keep talking? No, let's, let's get started here. Great to be together, isn't it? You know, as a, as a church, we exist not just for ourselves. In fact, we have been given a global mission. And today starts a three-week exploration into that mission and also the consideration of the call that it has on each of our lives. We look forward to walking with Pastor Jim as he takes us in several passages in the book of Acts. As we begin, we'd love to acknowledge our guest. If uh, you're with us for the first time, we want to say uh, a warm welcome. So glad that the Lord has uh, directed you to come and be with us today. Um, we hope that as you worship with us that you would grow in your understanding and your experience of the love of Jesus Christ, uh, the one who came uh, to earth on a mission himself, a mission to bring us the forgiveness of sins and newness of life. Uh, we'd love to get to know you, and the way we do that at Camelback, we ask you to take out your phone, text, welcome CBC to 94000, welcome CBC to 94000. That'll connect you with our digital welcome card. If you give us a little information about yourself, then we can keep you informed of what's going on in our church family. Lots of things in the next month or two you want to uh, be, uh, be aware of. So please give us that information. And then just so you know, the first Sunday of every month, usually at the 9 o'clock hour, we have something called Discovery One, which is an opportunity for you to learn the basics of our church, uh, meet some people, and get some of your, your questions answered. Uh, as a church, we are on a mission, and as a mission, we're also supporting other uh, agencies that are on a mission, and one of those agencies is Operation Christmas Child. Uh, that's, uh, we take shoe boxes, we fill them with goodies, and then they are shipped to kids all over the world. And part of that ministry is when the kids receive these gifts, uh, they also have the opportunity to be in a 10-week discipleship class to learn more about Jesus and the good news. Um, and so we just have a couple of boxes left. I think it looks like there's three or four boxes left in the back. We'd like to get all of those filled. And next Sunday is the day you've got to bring them filled uh, with the postage and everything else all set. Uh, and then we're going to deliver them the following Monday. If you don't bring them next Sunday, then you're going to have to deliver them yourself or ship them yourself. So it's really important that you bring those boxes uh, next Sunday. Also, we have the opportunity to help the Creighton Foundation. Um, they've been having this uh, food ministry since COVID began. And we've helped out a couple times with our men's work days. And they've asked us to provide turkeys for their uh for their uh, turkey boxes that they're putting together for the folks uh, in, the, in the Creighton area. Um, there is a box back there with a big turkey. You can't miss it. And there's envelopes. You don't have to bring a turkey. All, all they're asking is $20 per turkey. So if you want to provide five turkeys, put $100 in there. If you do it with a check, please make the check payable to the Creighton Foundation. We only have this week and next Sunday to provide those turkeys as uh, really, Thanksgiving is just right around the corner. So appreciate your participation in that. Uh, you have this flyer, uh, which, which has been handed to you as you've walked in today. The Women's Brunch uh, is on the 4th of December. Uh, it's a great uh, outreach. Um, we're encouraging our women to come, bring a friend, bring a, bring a neighbor, uh, bring somebody who needs to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. Make sure you sign up on the Church Center app for that. The day after that, on December 5th, our Saints Alive are going to have a uh, brunch. Uh, that's for the 55 plus. Uh, again, uh, we encourage you to sign up on the Church Center app. And we also are encouraging you, look around. If there's somebody that needs an invite, invite them to come with you. That's part of us as a church being uh, on a mission. Also, during the holidays, uh, for those of us who have suffered uh, a loss of a loved one, uh, holidays can be a, a rough time. And uh, our Grief Share ministry has something called Surviving the Holidays. Uh, it's a one week uh, a class, if you will, that just helps folks who've been, who's been, who've been through a loss to be able to deal with that loss during the holidays. That actually is taking place this Tuesday. And uh, you'll need to sign up for that on the Grief, uh, the grief Share 
uh, website, we should have somebody in the back at the end of the service to help you sign up if you'd like to participate. But that's this Tuesday. Uh, some of you have wondered if we're going to have a Thanksgiving service and uh, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, and we are, and we are including pie. So set aside that Wednesday night before Thanksgiving for a great time coming together, thanking the Lord for his goodness, and then enjoying fellowship and pie. Now, I am not very observant, uh, maybe some of you are, but I did notice that somebody in the band was wearing something shiny on their, on their finger, um, and that's uh, Rachel Callen, engaged now to Andrew Lang. <laughs> Andrew there, we're uh, so happy for you guys, and... Uh, Look forward to journeying with you in the, in the days ahead. Well, I'd like to read a few verses from Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Why don't we stand and sing those exact words. When I look your heavens, the moon and stars, he set in motion, oh God, I sing all glory and honor, what is man that you are mindful, the son of man that you would care for him, I sing all glory and honor,
Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth, in all the
God. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, this morning we, um, we echo in prayer this morning the, the words of that song. May the peoples praise you. May we praise you this morning. May, may we be glad. May we sit in the joy um, that we have in you, Lord. As we consider Acts this morning, let's be reminded of, remind us, Lord, instill us from your word, the means um, that we accomplish this gladness and this joy, Lord, the work that you did, Lord, um, that Jesus bore our sins on the cross, um, that he defeated death, despising the shame, being resurrected in life, and, and as, as we see in Acts this morning, Lord, um, as he ascends, he sends his spirit. He sends his disciples to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth so that the nations um, can participate, partake in what Jesus did for them, what Jesus did for us. May we marvel at that this morning. May we worship you in recognition of that fact this morning, Lord. Um, I was struck just in thinking of this is a promise kept. This is a promise fulfilled. Um, going all the way back to Abraham, Lord, who you promised to, to make a, a great nation, to be a blessing to all nations, Lord. And, and Jesus filled that. And so we, we worship you for, for your steadfastness, Lord, and for your sufficiency, that you were able to accomplish this, um, that you loved, um, that you keep your promises, that you're, that you're trustworthy, that you are good, and that you're steadfast even when we are not. I also think of, of Ephesians chapter 3 where, where you tell us that this was a mystery revealed that not just the original people of God were to be included but Gentiles Lord and, and that's the context of Acts and so may we be reminded of just how truly the deepness of this mystery it is in fact a mystery that you would love us enough to save us we who had rejected you we who do not seek you, we who are not good or right, and yet you loved us. You loved us enough to send us your son. May we, may we contemplate that. Um, may that draw us to, to repent and turn towards you. And may that compel us to, to worship you with our hearts, with our mouths as we sing, with our lives. And it's your precious name that we pray. Amen.
sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. to remember in your word that you've told us what your great will, what your purpose is for this world. And that is to bring everything together under Jesus Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. And Lord, you said in your word that every knee, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to your glory, O God, our Father. And so, Lord, we praise you, and we praise you, Lord Jesus, who is right now ruling at the right hand of God over everything in the universe. And, Lord, we resonate with your will. We want to align ourselves with what you're doing in this world, and that is making Jesus preeminent above everything. So we pray that that great vision, that great purpose will be true in our own hearts. Lord, we want our hearts to align with your will. Teach us to obey. Teach us to fight against sin. Lord, we pray that you would shape our priorities and our directions and our decisions so that we're thinking about how does my life fit in with God's great purpose of lifting Jesus above all things. Pray that that vision would capture our hearts. 
Lord, we pray for that vision in our families. We pray that our children would hear about Jesus, that they wouldn't just uh, grow up in a Christian culture and be acculturated uh, into um, Christian behavior, but that they would genuinely be saved and that Jesus would be preeminent in their hearts. They wouldn't just learn how to behave right in church as a Christian, but that Christ would be in their hearts. We pray that for them. We pray that Christ would be preeminent in our marriages as husbands and wives love and honor each other. We pray that as singles, Christ would be preeminent as we see your great purpose for our lives and find great joy and direction and satisfaction and fulfillment in that. We pray, Lord, for Christ to be preeminent not only in our hearts and not only in our families, but in our church. We pray that you would join us together from the hearts that we can link arms and join hands to make Jesus known here in the valley and around the world. We want to lift you up together. We pray, Lord, that you would um, give us grace as a church to reach out with the gospel. We think of our neighbors who need to hear about you. I think about my own neighbors. And we pray that each of us individually, that we would see ourselves at work or at home or with our friends at the gym, that we would see ourselves there with a purpose, that our lives are to make Jesus known and lift him up. And that would give direction and that you'll open uh, people's hearts to hear and respond and follow Jesus. We pray, Lord, for ourselves as a church as we join hands for world evangelism, reaching around the world with the good news of Christ. And we pray particularly for um, our missionaries, and we ask that you would give us one heart with them, that together we'll be uh, one heartbeat for the name of Jesus to be lifted up around this world. Particularly this morning, we think of uh, Bob and Judy Moffat, now living in California, but leading ministry around the world. And we think of our sister Marie Blanchard in Spain, teaching students and talking to neighbors and part of the growth of the gospel there, making Jesus known in Spain. We pray for grace to her. And we pray for ourselves during this uh, these weeks where we're uh, having an emphasis on missions that you'll give us a heart that burns together to see Jesus lifted up around the world. Lord, as we do that, we pray for ourselves as a body, particularly those who are in need. We think of those who are in physical need. We think of Hank and Lucas and Gary and Randy and Lisa and others who are just known personally. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving, particularly Nancy Whalen, as she's grieving the loss of her mother this week. Lord, we pray that together as we're gathered as your people this morning that you will shape us and open our eyes to see Jesus and align our hearts to yours. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been singing our praise to God and we're doing this here together. So let's just take a minute and uh, greet the people that are around us and then I'll call us back together in just a second. Thanks for playing. All right, man.
All right, let's pull it back together. All right. All right, all right, hello. All right, well, as we're getting back together here now, we've got some great conversations that have started and uh, keep them going after the service. Uh, remember, um, when it comes to welcoming people to the church, I mean, you are the welcome committee. So if you met someone that's new, make sure that you continue to reach out. And if you are new, we pray that you're able to just connect with some people uh, right now. Well, when we join together for ministry from the heart, we, one of the ways we do that is financially for, growth, for the growth of the gospel. And so... Um, during this time, we think we, we are offering ourselves. Um, if you brought a gift, uh, a tithe or offering, you can drop it in the back on the way out. There should be a box for that right on the wall. Um, and um, many of us are giving online. And you can text give CBC to 94000, and that will bring you to the link on our website uh, to do that. As we do, we remember what it says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, I'm sorry, in Philippians chapter 4. I had the wrong passage. Isn't that embarrassing? pastor moments, right? Okay, here's what it says. Philippians chapter 4, it says, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Jesus is seated at the right hand of, the, of, of, the, um, of God's throne, ruling over everything in the universe, and he's the one that has promised to take care of us and to provide for us, and that's why we can give joyfully and generously. Intro, two, three. Let's pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> All right, let's sing this without the guy in the back, whoever that was. Mine are days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with Him, yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the King of Kings. But mine are tears in times of sorrow, darkness not. here as a stranger. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on the narrow way. One with Christ I will encounter, harm and hatred for his name. But mine is honor for this battle, strong to last the world, and he has said he will deliver safely to the golden shore. And mine are keys to Zion City, where beside the king I walk. For them my heart has found its treasure, Christ is mine. guys to stand up as we continue singing.
Christ is mine forever. Christ is mine forever. Christ is mine forever. This morning's reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Joel. And uh, thanks for being flexible, Joel. I... uh Asked him right at the last minute, hey, can you read verses 1 through 8 instead of 6 through 8? And uh, he just jumped right on and did it, so appreciate that. Well, um, back at the beginning of September, the elders had a retreat. Uh, We do that periodically to step back and think about um, the uh, ministry of Camelback and where we're going and if uh, we're fulfilling the mission and direction that God has given us. So pastors and elders gathered together and we thought about where we're at. Our purpose here as a church is we're here to extend the love of Christ to all people, and we do that by focusing on Jesus' community and mission. And so we thought through the church in terms of that. And one of the things that we uh, decided was that that third part, that outward part of mission, focusing on mission, was an area where we really need to grow. And so we thought over this coming year we would really focus on that. And with that in mind, this fall, we've been really working on this whole idea of outreach and mission and, being, and, and uh, going out with the gospel. And that's why, uh, for instance, we had the sermon series on Jonah, because that's all about going out uh, to the nations and Jonah going to uh, his enemies. And then as we came to the month of November, we thought instead of just having one Sunday for missions, um, we would actually make that an emphasis for the first three Sundays of November. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, We're starting a series, a short three-week series called Major Moments and Missions from the book of Acts, and we're looking at Acts 1, 1 through 8 today, and then next week we'll look at Acts chapter 13, where the Holy Spirit sends out the first official missionaries, and then Acts 16, uh, on the 21st, I think it is, if I got my math right there, uh, which is going to be... uh, Focus on the gospel actually going to Europe as um, God directed um, Paul and Silas there. So that's where we're at today, and that's what we're starting, and we really want to be a church that is uh, committed to and focused on world evangelism. So as I think about that, if you're like me, um, you check your phone several times a day for news. Um, You might be thinking about, like, latest score, or maybe you wanted to check on the elections last Tuesday and you're checking your phone, or it might be local news that you're interested in. We check our phones pretty often for news to keep on top of what's going on. But the biggest story of the world in the world is never reported in the news. The biggest story in the world is never reported. And that is that from the throne of heaven... Jesus Christ is ruling over all things to build his church. That is the big story of what's happening in the world. Right now, he is actually working by his spirit, through his people, 
saving men and women from their sins, giving them new life, restoring them, directing Christians from one part of the world to another, and building his church. And we see that in the book of Acts. Sometimes we call the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles. But really a better way of thinking about the book of Acts is the Acts of the risen Christ. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. And so we see Jesus from the throne of heaven ruling over all sorts of things in the book of Acts, from storms to earthquakes to people to kings. All of this building his church. And he's doing that today. God is working in amazing ways today, in big ways and small, to bring people to Jesus and build his church. As I was thinking about this, my mind went back a few years ago to when I was uh, visiting missionaries in Thailand. I used to be a missions pastor, and so one of the things I did was go and visit missionaries. And I was visiting missionaries in Thailand, and uh, we went up to the border with Myanmar uh, to a town called Chiang Rai, And we met with a group of believers from a a tribe in Burma. And um, as we were meeting with, they had traveled like two weeks to get to sneak across the border and meet with us. And um, we asked them, well, how did you hear about Jesus? They said, oh, well, uh, these people from Laos, they're from the Yellow Lahu tribe. Um, They were traveling through our area selling things. They were merchants pots and pans and, you know, cooking oil, rice, that sort of stuff. But they were believers. And they also told us about Jesus. And that's how that tribe had heard, first heard about Christ, Laotian believers telling believers in Burma, Myanmar, about Christ. And now they had traveled down to meet with this missionary that I was with, who was with Wycliffe Bible Translators, because they wanted God's word in their language. And so I stepped back and I thought about how all this was fitting together. People, anonymous believers, telling others, and then Westerners coming and the church is being built. It's pretty astounding. God was at work. Or I think about uh, um, a missionary that I had breakfast with a few years ago, a guy named Harry Ballback. And back in the late 50s, he was an older guy, uh, he and his friend Harold Reimer uh, were returning to Brazil for their second term. Their first term hadn't gone so well. They had tried to reach a tribe in the Amazon, and they realized this is just way too much. We're never going to reach all the, all the tribes in the Amazon. We need to somehow recruit Brazilians to do this. So they were taking the boat back to Brazil, and before they landed, they, they said, Lord, we don't know what to do, so we're just going to get on the bus and get off at the first stop and trust that you're going before us. So that's what they did. They got off the boat, they got on a bus, and the first stop of that bus happened to be in a town called Atibaya. And as they got off the bus, they said, they asked somebody, do you know if there are any Christians, followers of Jesus in this town? And they said, yeah, there are a couple guys that live down on this street on that, at that house. And so they walked over to where uh, they, were, they were directed uh, to go. And as they walked up to the front of this house, they looked through the window and they saw two men on their knees. They said, this is probably the right place. Knocked on the door, the guys got up, and sure enough, they were Christians. And they said, we were just actually praying right now that God would send us missionaries. The Acts of the Risen Christ. Jesus right now is ruling from the throne of God over everything to spread the good news of his death and resurrection and and salvation through him and build his church. This is the greatest news story in the world. This is at the heart of our purpose as a church. And this is what we're going to be focusing on over these next few weeks. What is God doing and how do we fit into that? This morning, as we look at Acts 1.8, I want to see, we're going to start with three key principles that come out of these verses. Three key principles that direct us and give shape to the work that we do as Christians. Making Jesus known. And the first principle is that we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. And we see that in verses 4 and 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, 
which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. We can't do it alone. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God's presence and power to go with us and work through us. Jesus has to give them this command. Now, humanly speaking, they were ready to go. They were fully trained. Think about what they had been through and the training they had received. Just in the previous verse, verse 3, it says that they had been with Jesus for 40 days. And they had seen convincing proofs that he was alive again. This is the central message of the Bible, that the same Jesus who died is now alive again. He's stronger than death. He can forgive your sins. He's alive. And not only did they have proof that Jesus was alive, these men who knew him really well, but he also taught them about the kingdom of God. And in verse 2, if we go back a little bit farther, we see that he gave them commands, which must have included the Great Commission to go into all the world with the gospel. So you would think they're fully trained and ready to go. And then if you go back into the Gospels, it's even more compelling that they were ready to go. Because in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, we found out that Jesus had sent out these two, these, uh, the same group of people, two by two, as short-term missionaries. So they had practical training, too. If you turn back to Luke chapter 24, we find out that Jesus had also opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So picture who these disciples were at this time. Minds opened by Jesus to understand the Bible. They had practical experience already in short-term missions, and they had been taught by Jesus for 40 days. Surely they're ready. No. He says, wait. With all this training, they needed something more. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, all their training and work and background was worthless. One key reason is that what we're doing when we carry the gospel and as Christ builds a church is actually a miracle. Whenever anybody comes to Christ, a miracle has happened right at that moment. They were blind, and God opens their eyes to see. They were dead spiritually, and now they're alive to respond to Christ. They were enemies, and now they become dearly loved children. A miracle happens whenever anybody comes to Christ. People don't come to Jesus simply because We've learned a gospel presentation really well and we're eloquent. Our eloquence doesn't bring anybody to Christ, nor does our best strategy. All the training in the world don't do anything unless God is at work. The nature of salvation, a miracle happens. We need God's work. And that's something that we cannot do in our own strength. We can't carry the gospel around the world in our own strength. We need God's spirit, his presence, to be working in and through us. A.J. Gordon was the founder of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in 1889. And um, one day he was out for uh, a walk. And as he was walking uh, Donna Rody saw a farmhouse in the distance and there was a man pumping water. You know, picture one of those old-timey pumps, you know, you're kind of doing that. And as he was walking and getting closer to this farmhouse, this guy just didn't stop. He just kept pumping. And he's thinking, what is going on? And then he just kept pumping and kept pumping this water. He's like, he, surely he's filled up 10 buckets by now. Why is he still pumping water? His curiosity got the best of him. And so he walked over to the farmhouse, and as he got closer, he could see that it wasn't a man at all. It was a wooden outline silhouette of a man that was painted, and his arm was actually hinged. And his arm was hooked up to an artesian well that was producing water by itself. In fact, the water was pumping the man. And that's the way it is when the Holy Spirit is working through us. 
He is giving us energy and strength for this work. And that's the power that they would experience when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, which is in the very next chapter. With all their training, with all their experience, the gospel would go out to the world as the Holy Spirit worked through them. They had to wait for the water to start flowing. And once they did, once it did, they needed to keep their hand on the handle. Now this is a reality that we need to take to heart as we think about going out with the gospel. We're here to extend the love of Christ to all people. We focus on Jesus, community, and missions. And as we focus outward on mission, we need the power of God to be working in and through us. We can't do it ourselves by ourselves. We can't do it alone. Now the good news is we don't have to wait like they did. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, and if you're a believer, you received the Holy Spirit when you came to faith. In fact, that's how you came to faith. We're dead spiritually. The Spirit makes us alive to respond to him. He opens our eyes to see Christ. When you came to faith, you received the Holy Spirit. That's why John can tell all Christians... Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Spirit of God's inside of you. And that gives great confidence. It's hugely encouraging. Because think about what this means. The same spirit that hovered over the waters of creation in Genesis 1 is in you. That's an astounding thought. The same spirit that spoke through the prophets is in you. The same spirit that strengthened the church fathers, Irenaeus and Cyprian and Tertullian, Augustine, Basil, Gregory the Great, is in you. You're connected in that way with all these great heroes of church history that have gone before us, the great reformers. John Huss in Bohemia, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wycliffe, John Knox, William Tyndale, John and Charles Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, William Wilberforce, who was instrumental in ending slavery in the British Empire. The same spirit that has been at work in women and men throughout history is in you. And that is encouraging. During World War II, Navy pilots learned how to land on aircraft carriers in really short airfields. And shortly afterwards, they realized that, wait a second, these planes could actually be a really great way of getting missionaries to places where they couldn't go otherwise. And so that's how Mission Aviation Fellowship was born, guys that had learned and been taught how to land in pretty difficult circumstances. The same spirit is in you. The same spirit is in you as you're talking to your neighbor and your friends. As you're teaching your kids. As you're joining hands with others for ministry. That same Holy Spirit. It's hugely encouraging and it's also a reminder that we are completely dependent on God. We need to keep our hand on the handle. The world is not going to see Jesus simply because we're really well organized and we've got a great strategy. No, the Spirit has to be at work. And for the Spirit to be at work, we need to stay in step with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, it says in Galatians. Because sin will take your hand off the pump. And imagine that wooden figure just hanging limp here. That's the way we are if we're not walking with the Spirit. So we need to cultivate the Spirit's presence in our lives, not grieve Him. Embrace His fruit of the Spirit, love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Listen to the Spirit's voice in in the Word. Walk in the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Filling is a sense of rule. Have the Spirit rule in your life and lead you. We're dependent on Him. 
And if we're dependent on him, that means, of course, that we need to pray. Pray for ourselves. Pray for our children. For our church. For non-believers. We're asking for a miracle in their lives. And for God to raise up workers. We can't do this alone. We need the Spirit's work and his power. The second thing to notice, the second principle that we see in these verses is that we don't have much time. We don't have much time. And we see that in verses 6 and 7. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Why are they asking about this? Well, Jesus had promised the Holy Spirit and the coming of the Holy Spirit marked the beginning of the last days. We're in the last days right now, and we have been for 2,000 years. The prophet Joel says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And then just a little bit later he says, and at that time I will restore the kingdom to Israel. So the reason why they asked about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel is because they had been reading their Bibles. And they knew from Joel chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3 that when the Spirit came, the last days began, and restoration was there. And so when they heard Jesus talk about the Spirit, they thought, oh, this is the time when everything's going to be restored. They knew their Bibles. That's why they're asking this. Jesus doesn't correct their interpretation but he speaks to their curiosity and their timing. It's not for you to know. The Father has set the dates. Those things are happening. Joel thought they were happening at the exact same time. But they're actually separated. And we're in a valley of time between the coming of the Holy Spirit and the restoration of Israel and all things. How does this work? Well, um, when we lived in Tulsa, we loved taking road trips. And so um, if you've ever driven to Colorado and to the Rockies from the east, um, you've seen something about what, how this works. So we're driving across Kansas, you know, got all the kids in the car. Are we there yet? No. I got to go to the bathroom. Okay, hold on. So we're driving across flat Kansas. There's nothing there. You get to the Colorado border and you're like, yes, we're almost there. No, you're really not. Colorado is a big state, and you've got to go halfway across the state before you finally get to the mountains, right? And finally, you see off in the distance this line, this shadow. It looks almost like a cloud. And it looks like all these mountains are right on top of each other. But then as you get closer, you realize, no, there's the front range, and there's actually big valleys between these peaks that look like they were right together when you're far away. And that's the way it was, is for, was for the prophets. They were looking from a distance. These things looked as if they were happening at the same time, the coming of the Spirit and the restoration of Israel. But then as it got closer, there's actually a big valley of time between those two things. And we are now in that valley. The first things happened, we're waiting for the second thing. And we don't know how long that time is. You can think of it as being in overtime. When you're in overtime, how do you play? If your team is in overtime, you play with extra energy, you dig deep, you make sure your best players are on the field, the entire team comes together to really put your energies in because you're in overtime. There's not, you've got to get this done. And that's the perspective that we have here for missions. There's not much time. That means that we need extra energy. There's an urgency. And we need our best players on the field. We need to send our best. We need to give our best. We need our best to go. Missions isn't just something for people who couldn't make it here in America or, you know, let's just send them. They'll do okay. No, I mean, it's only about the growth of the gospel and the growth of the church. I mean, other than that, why send our best? That was sarcasm. But no, we send our best. I think back to a couple, Victor and uh, Rachel Troutwine that I met. I was a missions pastor for a number of years. We actually put together a missions consortium 
so, um, to send missionaries. And so the way it worked was that the home church, this is when I was a missions pastor in Wheaton, the home church in the western suburbs of Chicago would um, pick up 30% of the support, and then the other churches in the area, these sister churches that we were working with, would each pick up 10%. And so with eight churches in the consortium, you could have a missionary 100% supported in months and get them out to the field. And then when they came back, they would have all of their supporting churches right there in a localized area. It was a great plan. It worked really well. And so we got to know missionaries from these other churches that were in the consortium. And one of them was this couple, uh, Victor and Rachel Trotwine. Victor was a Dartmouth grad and then a Wharton School for his, M Wharton for his MBA and was an executive. Rachel, um, I, I'm, I'm I said she went to Yale in the first year, but she didn't. As I was thinking back, she, uh, she went to Stanford and was a, had her medical degree from there, was a doctor. Great couple, very successful, and yet they felt God tap them on the shoulder and say, I've got something even more important for you. And so they both quit their jobs and ended up moving to the Dominican Republic to help run an orphanage where they could tell children about Jesus. Our best, our own children that grow up at Camelback to say, this is overtime. We want them to go. That's something that we should be praying for because the time is short. We can't do it alone. We don't have much time. And the third principle is that we carry the word of God, and we see that in verse 8. This verse has often been mis misunderstood, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Often misunderstood and misapplied. And the first question is, who are the witnesses that he's talking about here? My dad taught missions at Trinity Divinity School for a number of years, and um, because of that, he would speak at missions conferences. And so when, there were, when the churches that he was speaking at were local, I would sometimes go with him. And so I would sit in the congregation and look up on, the, on the, uh, the, back of the back behind the pulpit, and they might have a banner that said, you are my witnesses. And then the theme of the conference would be, hey, you're a witness, go be a witness about Jesus, based on Acts 1.8. But that's not what this is saying. Let's read this again. When it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses, who is you? Who's that pronoun referring to? It's not talking about every Christian. It's talking about these 11 disciples. In the book of Acts, this word witness has a special meaning. It refers to people who were eyewitnesses of Jesus' death and resurrection. And they had a special role in the church of being eyewitness testimony to that this same Jesus who died rose again. That is their function as apostles. We sometimes call that the apostolic witness. And you can see that for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Look at the end of this chapter. Look at verse 21. You remember they, Judas had betrayed them, and so there was only 11 disciples, apostles instead of 12, and so they decided we've got to replace Judas. And so it says in verse 21, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. That's the witness that we're talking about here. You can see the same thing again. This is all through the book of Acts. Look with me at chapter 10, verse 39 and following. Peter is preaching to Cornelius, a Roman centurion. And what does P Peter say in Acts chapter 10, verse 39? He says, And we are witnesses of all that Jesus did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, which is a polite word for cross, 
because the Roman word for cross was actually a four-letter word, and so they would say tree instead. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. And get verse 41. And made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So the specific witness that Acts is talking about is eyewitness testimony to Jesus' death and resurrection, his ministry, death, and resurrection. It's not all of our witness, although we are to tell people about Jesus, but here in Acts 1.8, it's talking about the apostles. We sing that song sometimes, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the answer to that is, no. You weren't, and neither was I. Were you there when he rose up from the tomb? The answer is, no. You weren't, and neither was I. But they were. And that's their witness. And they will be witnesses, he says, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And that gives an outline for the rest of the book of Acts as this apostolic testimony to Christ, their witness to his death and resurrection, spreads around the world. And in fact, that's how the book of Acts is shaped. uh, Roughly speaking, chapters 1 through 5 focus on Jerusalem and Judea, 6 through 9 focus on Samaria, 10 through 12 the gospel goes out to Gentiles, 13 through 16 the gospel is growing in Turkey as the Apostle Paul is, is, uh, is uh, a missionary. And then uh, 17 through 19 in Greece, and then 20 through 28, the gospel goes to Rome. So we've got this spreading gospel in the book of Acts. But here's the thing. It says to the ends of the earth. We know that the gospel went to Rome in the book of Acts. We know that Paul wanted to go to Spain. We read about that in Romans 15. The Apostle Thomas, according to tradition, went to southern India. And in fact, there's a Christian community in southern India that traces its lineage back to Thomas. But did they ever get all the way to Phoenix? Did any of these apostles, whose witness is going to go to the ends of the earth, ever come to the foot of Camelback Mountain and preach? No. So what is Jesus saying here? How will their witness go to the ends of the earth? The New Testament is the written record of the witness of the apostles. And when we carry this Bible, these words, to the ends of the earth, the apostles are bearing witness to the world. This means that our gospel ministry has to be profoundly word-centered. We carry the Bible. The Apostle John said at the beginning of 1 John, that which our, our eyes have seen and our ears have heard and our hands have touched, this we proclaim regarding the word of truth. And we carry their testimony when we carry the Scriptures. So this is a robustly word-centered approach to missions that Jesus is saying here. It's a prophecy. What you have seen and heard is going to be proclaimed to the world, and it happens through the scriptures. That means that missions has to be radically word-centered, that whatever we do, and in all the different strategies that we're a part of, at the core, we are bringing people to the Bible. In fact, you could say this. Christians can and should do all sorts of good things in this world. However, if a United Nations agency can do the things that we're doing, then it's not missions. What makes it distinctively missions is the word of God, is the gospel, is the testimony of the apostles. That's what makes it distinctively Christian missions. And we do it in all sorts of different ways, church planting, orphanages where we teach children, going out with uh, relief in in disasters, 
meeting physical needs as well as spiritual needs, teaching people about Jesus, happens in all sorts of different ways. But at the core of it are the scriptures. This is why Christians are really committed to Bible translation. According to Wycliffe, there are 7,378 languages in the world that are spoken. 717 of them have the whole Bible in their language. Another 1,582 have the New Testament. And an almost 1,200 have some portion of the New Testament. But still, one in five people do not have the Bible in their, in their, in their language in the world. And if we are committed to seeing the witness of the apostles go to the ends of the earth, we're going to be committed to translating the Bible. And that's what some of our missionaries are part of. We're going to have the opportunity over the next few weeks to be able to hear more about this and be part of this. We're going to have missionaries that are here uh, next week on the 14th. And so I, would, I really encourage you to sit down and talk to them, get to know them so that you can be praying for them specifically. We want the same heart beating in us that's beating in them. One heart, we are, go- they are, send- we are senders, they are goers, if you want to think of it that way. But we have the same vision and purpose and direction. If we truly believe that we can't do this alone, we need to be praying for our missionaries. We need to be praying for ourselves. Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest and ask him to raise up um, uh, workers for his harvest. So as we look around our own church, we're praying and we're saying, Lord, raise up workers from this church for world evangelism. Are you willing to pray that for your children? Are you willing to pray that for yourself? If you understand what the greatest unreported news story in the world is, then you will be. Because Jesus Christ is seated at the throne of God, on the throne of God in heaven right now, ruling over all things, building his church, saving men and women, restoring their lives, gathering us together so that we can serve. And we look at our lives with new eyes. We keep our hand on the handle. We are completely dependent. We play like it's overtime because the time is short. We carry the word of God. And when we do, God does amazing things. Remember I told you about those two missionaries that went to Atibaia in Brazil? I actually sat down for lunch with one of those guys a few years ago. And I looked around me at what God had done in that city. It's astounding. Where there had been just two Christians back in the late 50s, there were probably 20 large churches now. And I got to preach in one of them, 1,500 people in a warehouse. And I think the average median age was maybe 20. And they were like on fire. There's a seminary there now uh, with Word of Life that's training hundreds of, of, of gospel workers every year. And the church in Brazil, like is happening in other places, is sending out missionaries and supporting missionaries from other countries. We have friends, uh, Bruce and Becky Wilson, who were in Indonesia. They're from America, supported mostly by American churches, but then they had several Brazilian churches reach out and say, hey, we want to have a part in the work in Indonesia. Can we support you? And they're like, yeah. Amazing what God will do. If we realize that we can't do it alone, the time is short, and we carry his word. This is how the gospel grows. And as we, get, as we share communion together, we're joining our hands and our hearts for this great work. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this mission, this purpose. And we pray that you would join us together from the heart for your great work in this world. Amen.
table together. If you don't have one of these cups, I'm going to, uh, you might want to run back there and grab one real quick. Uh, maybe if somebody around you doesn't have one, you can get one for them too. Redeeming love is our theme. And that's what this communion 
table reminds us of, the redeeming love of Christ, that he gave his life for us and he rose again for us. And that's what we're remembering as we share the bread and the cup. And this is what we carry, this is the good news that we carry to the ends of the earth. So our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had broken it, he gave thanks and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance. Lord, we thank you for this bread that reminds us of your great rescue mission. That you took on flesh and became a human being just like us. And lived our life and walked our streets and felt our joys and our sorrows. All so that you could save us. And so we thank you for this bread that reminds us of your body, your physical body like ours, that you died and rose again for sinners like us, and that you came to bring salvation to the world. And we thank you for the life that is represented in this cup, that you gave your life, you poured out your blood to give us life. And it's life that spreads from one end of the globe to the other. And we thank you. Amen. After supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see.
said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And I am with you always to the end 